right. Uh, thank you, everyone, again, uh, and welcome back. Uh, really appreciate everybody joining here today. Uh, so for our session, the sessions is Avengers Assemble, Threat Modeling Kubernetes Clusters at a Massive Scale. My name is Jamal Arif. I'm a senior solutions architect with AWS. Uh, I have been with AWS for over four years now and uh, been involved with uh, CNCF, with Kubernetes, with the community for past uh, seven years now. Uh, so really uh, great to be back with the team and kind of sharing uh, what we have uh, done within the on, on the threat modeling side. Alongside myself, I've got my colleague here as well. Sai, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, everyone. Hi. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Uh, my name is Sai, Sai Shilanteja Gopaluni. I'm a container specialist SA with AWS. Been with AWS for about eight years now. Actually, tomorrow it's going to be eight years. Uh, so nice to be here. Thank you for showing up the session. All right. So today in, a, in our session, we'll uh, walk through what is threat modeling, why do you threat modeling, and then directly dive into the meat of it. Uh, we'll cover a sample incident uh, for Kubernetes clusters, uh, talk about how you can use that sample incident to create threat statements, uh, then cover mitigation attack tech vectors and then the mitigation techniques. By the end of it, we'll also uh, share a tool that you can utilize to really create your own uh, threat modeling uh, through like at a massive scale for your clusters. So just information security one on one, essentially, I'm sure most of you have heard about it, but how many of you actually have heard or know kind of you know what CIA stands for? Awesome, I think uh, most of the team here knows. So essentially, it's confidentiality that you are making sure that uh, the data is uh, secure and accessible only to authorized users. Integrity that it's accurate and trustworthiness, and then with availability, you are making sure that yes, it's available only to the accessible users whenever they are needing it. With threat modeling, essentially you take a look at these three core principles, which are the framework for information security, and really understand what are some of the potential threats, what are some of the uh, vulnerabilities in your system, and then how you can mitigate those vulnerabilities to make sure that you are going back to the core framework of the CIA triad. So first of all, we should ask ourselves, uh, like how do security vulnerabilities get introduced in the first place? And they typically do with code and config that we are writing as humans, right, as builders. And we follow that software development lifecycle. And what we see is that within our software development lifecycle, there are multiple different stages where we can uh, first like understand what are the potential threats and get some kind of uh, details of it, detect them, and also mitigate them. So working backwards from a live system, uh, you might be getting details from security researchers or uh, through a bug bounty program if you have embarked on one. In your deployment pipelines, you might have some automated checks that you are doing as part of your uh, deployment as it goes from one uh, clusters or one environment to other environments and ultimately into production. You might be doing it in the testing phase as well with some form of dynamic analysis or penetration testing or at the build phase where you are actually building the code, doing some peer reviews or doing some static code analysis or using a bunch of different tools available within the community to do some static code analysis within the build phase. And then in the design phase, we typically see threat, threat modeling. Now we have different stages and one of the common questions comes up, why threat modeling in the design phase, right? The answer is what we see that as you move along or shift right, essentially or within this graph, if you are detecting and mitigating those security threats, the exponential, the, the cost of uh, detecting and mitigating them uh, exponentially goes really high. That's why there is a concept of shift left. So the earliest as possible you are uh, really understanding and what your security vulnerabilities are, what are potential threats, while you are in the stage the design phase, so that you can alternate your design and you're not uh, doing a bunch of uh, rework, which you might have to do if, if you are in uh, later stages. So that's why we always recommend threat modeling at the, uh, at the design phase. So moving ahead, why we use a threat model? 
essentially we identify those security issues uh, within our application, what is our business context, uh, what is our application, what are the security vulnerabilities very specific to our workload. And once we identify those early, we are able to uh, make some changes in the design phase so that we're not doing any rework later on in, in the workload, uh, in, the, in, the, in the life cycle of the software development itself. Now that we understand you know, threat modeling, why do we do it? What are the different ways uh, that you do uh, threat modeling? So again, there are multiple different ways that different uh, companies, organizations have followed. Uh, what I'm presenting over here is the Showstack's four question framework. Essentially, it's, it, these are kind of open-ended questions that can structure your thinking as you think about threat modeling. So you begin with, what are we working on? Essentially, what is your system? What is your business context? Uh, what's the security responsibilities or requirements for your workload? And you typically do that in the form of a data flow diagram. Sorry. Next is, what can go wrong? So once you understand that, uh, what can go wrong with your system and what is a potential threat to your uh, workload, which can result in some unwanted effects? What are we going to do about it? How do we mitigate that threat that we have identified in the second step? And then, then lastly, did we do a good enough job? Essentially, whenever you are doing threat modeling, uh, it's a continuous improvement process, right? You, identify, you, you, detect, you create a threat statement, you identify how do you mitigate them, but then it's a continuous step that you have to kind of go back and see how you can further improve it. So as we walk through towards, uh, to like in today's session, uh, we'll cover the aspect of Kubernetes uh, server level uh, threat modeling and take a look at these four steps as well. There's these four key uh, questions and kind of reflect back as you go along through the session today. Threat modeling is also a group activity where we need that diverse set of feedback from different members as well, right? Essentially kind of gathered together like a superhero team, which we are calling as the Avengers team. And it has five key personas as part of that team. So you have a business persona, which is essentially understanding the business context of your application, right? Like it's a, you're dealing with healthcare data or you're dealing with financial data. The second is the uh, developer persona who are really understanding the design aspect of your application, how you have implemented uh, the, app, the workload so that they can implement those mitigations as part of uh, the team here. And then you have adversary persona who can uh, kind of be in the shoes of an attacker critically analyze your workload, and then build up those threats or potential threats or vulnerabilities that are in your system. And then finally, uh, the fourth one is the defender persona, who is, is essentially looking at those threats that the adversary persona has created, and then figuring out what are the mitigations for, uh, for that. And then you have the application security subject matter expert. So they are the ones who are like really understand threat modeling. They are an, uh, an application security expert, uh, and they can really uh, you know, help these different personas uh, and help these cross-functional teams to kind of work together and build that threat modeling in essence. All right, so let's move ahead and let's take an example of an incident within Kubernetes cluster and then see you know, how you can build uh, a data flow diagram from there, or how you can understand what are we working on. So we have, you know, let's consider you are a platform engineer within uh, a Kubernetes environment. You have built that environment. You understand that environment well, and uh, typically, whatever, like typically, what always happens is that you get those pages late night, or you are getting those pages when you are vacationing in Hawaii or somewhere, and you get this kind of uh, report from your security engineer. So if you take a look at closely at, the, at it, you'll see that somebody is just doing a web request on the Secrets API within Kubernetes environment, and it can see all the different Secrets which are there. Now this is really bad. So you try to do a bit more troubleshooting, you figure out, okay, uh, is this endpoint one of my clusters? You see that it is. Um, next step is, okay, it is part of my cluster, let's do investigation a bit more. And you see that somebody has created or 
this roll binding. So within Kubernetes RBAC, roll binding is a way that you actually bind a, a user to a permission set. So you see that somebody has created a role binding and binded a cluster system anonymous user to cluster admin. Now this is again uh, really bad from security perspective, from all other perspective, because uh, a, a, a key as uh, like being a being a platform engineer, you know that it's something is major major wrong over here. All right, so you do a bit more investigation. So you take a look at. Uh, over here, I'm giving an example of EKS clusters, so I'm looking at CloudWatch uh, logs using log insights, running a quick quick query, and seeing, okay, which is the user ID or specific users who, are, who had access and created this uh, cluster system anonymous user. So I get additional details, and this actually helps me understand from a Kubernetes service level threat modeling, like how do I use this kind of a sample incident and essentially build a data flow diagram to understand, uh, going back to our four question framework, to understand what are we essentially working on and what's the, what, can, what can happen or what's the potential threat for my system. So next is coming up with a threat statement, essentially what can go wrong. When you look towards what can go wrong, um, essentially you are, there are like certain inputs which are very key as part of this exercise. So the first is what are we working on, something we just did in the previous steps. So you visualize through a data, way, data flow diagram that what are, uh, what's the security requirements, what's in scope, what's out of scope for my workload. Uh, next is the business context. So what's the business context for my, is it a financial customer or a healthcare data that I'm working with? Uh, different kind of threat frameworks which I can use, for instance, Stride framework. Uh, or an additional uh, threat intelligence information. So you might be looking at OWASP top 10 uh, for any case. These kind of inputs actually result uh, in a threat statement. So a threat statement essentially gives you um, a detailed or a consistent uh, way of writing what is a potential threat to your system. Uh, like any potential activity that has unwanted effect to your system. So let's go ahead and maybe build out a threat statement together as part of the exercise, right? Uh, typically, a threat statement would have uh, an external threat actor, so a source, uh, some form of prerequisites. Uh, it will have an action that what that external threat act, uh, actor can do, uh, which leads to what's the impact of that threat. And then essentially, uh, what is the impact to the assets or what's the negative impact to your goal as part of your overall threat statement? So within Kubernetes, uh, you, somebody, some external threat can get access to uh, kubectl port forward, which can essentially give them the ability to retrieve uh, API server metadata. Now with that, they can actually utilize the information in there to do something like server-side request forgery. And now uh, the negative impact is that now you're essentially impacting that confidentiality of your data. Going back to the uh, CIA triad we were earlier talking about, it directly talks about the confidentiality of data and how it is affected. Now, uh, I'll, I'll let my colleague kind of talk about one of the tools that you can utilize uh, to build these threat statements at scale. Thanks, Jamal. Uh, how many of you here built or written these threat statements within your organizations before? Yeah? So uh, you might have seen how tedious it gets uh, across the architectures at a scale. Uh, we have this tool called Threat Composer. What it does is it gives you a contextual brainstorming ability. You can gather your teams along, the adversary, apps makes me, business personas that we saw earlier. Uh, you can have dynamic suggestions with it, and it, it also renders uh, the threat statements while you're working towards it making it easier for you to generate a threat model for your architecture. A sample UI in that um, uh, Threat Composer tool would look something like this, wherein uh, when you're trying to work through this, uh, it's gonna prompt and give you ability to fill, fill, complete that statement. Along with that, you can link the assumptions, mitigations, and create a matrix in the end. Now, when we talked about these, we have seen the two pillars of that Showstack framework essentially uh, existing from incident to what are we gonna do about it. 
Now, the third one we're going to talk about is uh, attack vectors. What are we going to do about it? Once we know, uh, we have a threat statement. If you look at MITRE attack, uh, attack, attack matrix, uh, we have several adversary tactics, right? We have seen this elsewhere a bunch of times today in the keynote too, uh, like uh, initial access, execution, persistence, all these tactics that are available, each provide adversaries with several techniques that they can exploit. For example, if we take, uh, if we have a system where there's a compromised image uh, that is existing in your cluster, that can compromise the entire cluster, as in the adversary can inject a malicious code into the image, uh, which at the persistence tactic level, uh, it could go towards creating backdoor containers, like a daemon sets, uh, within each of, your, each of your workload architectures, leading to privileged escalation at that point, and eventually the data destruction. If we double click on this, uh, at each layer, like we have different techniques, uh, and this could expand to even a situation where they can have, instead of recommended practice of not having host path at all, uh, they could go on, exploit, and have a writable host path mount, uh, leading to lateral attacks, lateral movement, where they get access to wider data spectrum within the cluster, wider workloads that are running within the cluster, and can plan for future attacks. And this could lead to further more data destruction, and the blast radius could increase. Dialing it back to our uh, Kubernetes level, as we are thinking about this, uh, we'll think about, uh, in this case, uh, we have a managed Kubernetes cluster control plane in the form of EKS cluster. Um, when we are thinking about it, we think about the API server level security, what it manages, what it interacts with. All those ar arrows we see are the data flow patterns around these things, and this this is what we'll focus as part of our session today, as in the uh, threats that are to and fro from Kubernetes aspects, whether it be the admin APIs that your ops engineers are accessing to run certain commands, deploy the workloads, or build systems that are interacting to directly do the same uh, in a CI-CD fashion. And, that, and at the last level, you have these data interactions that your pod will take, uh, whether it be with the underlying databases that we see, or other storage solutions that are there, uh, creating you a, a, a space where there is a data exfiltration chance. And that creates us a situation where when we zoom in onto the Kubernetes cluster itself, we have these different flows that needs to be taken into account uh, when we are doing a threat modeling aspect. And if you double click, at a pod level, this would even go much further to an extent a pod interacting with another pod on IC2 instance, pod interacting with the host file system, uh, or logging daemon sets that you're going to deploy, or any other monitoring daemon sets that you deploy. And once we have identified our architecture and we go about uh, identifying what are my access points, what are my exfiltration points, how do I go about threat modeling it. Now putting together threat statement and that, uh, we have to think about what are the mitigation measures that I want to place. And for that, uh, essentially, uh, you go, we, we recommend that you go about creating something called threat and control matrix that spans across four controls and four categories, essentially uh, directive, preventative, detective, and responsive. And it doesn't stop there, right? So these controls, for example, directive controls uh, can come from business persona uh, who is having an overall view of the application and defining what, what measures need to be impacted, implemented. Uh, and then preventative controls are the ones you would employ to deter once the incident is happening. And detective control is after the incident happens, how do we go about refining it and in the runtime level, and eventually responsive means forward looking on how do I go about ensuring that next time it happens, I have an immediate playbook or immediate made, uh, f framework that I can employ. And this is very crucial to have it uh, uh, standardized because at a scale when you have hundreds and thousands of clusters deployed across different application teams, uh, you need to have a structured framework, otherwise it could go 
it could go haywire. And across these categories, once you have controls and threats ma mapped, you would also want to have a SME persona that is responsible as a point of contact. Most often, this is not going to be just one, one persona per, uh, per a threat and control that we talk about. Uh, like in this case, for example, when we talked about a directive uh, measure, for that, while the business persona may be the defining person, uh, the adversary would come in, put in the shoes of attacker, and identify and, and collaborate with the business person to define it. Now, if you look at uh, these directive measures, right? So let's take an example uh, of OWASP top 10 attacks, like the big one, broken access control. Uh, the, the pattern of using operators to create custom resources has becoming very prevalent. Um, for example, in this case, if you have uh, an operator that has admin rights in the operator group, and you have developer who has all rights in the core Kubernetes group, the problem is that Kubernetes is an impersonate verb, uh, and that is governed by RBAC2. If you don't specify specific verbs, it will be a problem. And uh, like you see here, a developer can impersonate the uh, role or, or, or the group of operator to get the detail of the custom resource that is being deployed. How do you go about countering this or establishing mitigation measures for it? First and foremost, it starts with RBAC, right? RBAC policies should not be static once defined and that's set. It should always be evolving. It should be a continuous process. And how do you go about doing that? Uh, audit logs is the most con consistent way uh, to have your RBAC policies fine-grained uh, in, in a constant basis. Then the second one would be, uh, I have CSA drivers here, but it could be something else that you are deploying. These Controllers that you deploy should support token request mechanism. They should never be having a static access static uh, access key mechanism to uh, deploy a certain resource or work its, its responsibility. And lastly, uh, encryption, both in transit as well as REST, should be honored. From the preventative side of the world, um, like I was mentioning earlier, these are the controls that we often talk about that deter the undesirable events once they happen. Most importantly, one of the things that uh, Kubelet does by default is to have, uh, it automatically mounts the service accounts API credentials to uh, your var run secrets service account token uh, path. Uh, if you want to opt out of it, you need to explicitly mention this within, either within your pod or within the service account uh, to have auto mount service account token set to false. And then a um, lot of these clusters, when we talk about scale, as your complexity grows, you would, you would end up having multi-tenant clusters. You would go about having soft multi-tenancy with network namespaces that you might implement. So, and that warrants network segmentation, stronger network segmentation measures that needs to be defined ahead of time. And the same with uh, policy management as well, right? Often we would want uh, as, as a platform engineer, if I provision a cluster, I would essentially want my end developer to deploy what is being built. As in, if an image is built, it has to be cryptographically signed uh, so that uh, it's been verified during the deployment phase. And how do I go about verifying this? By having policy as a code solution that implements certain policies like open, pol open policy agent policies or Kiverno policies that can have your um, policies defined to establish certain guardrails around that. And lastly, the amount of modules that you want to avoid um, to ensure you don't have to constantly go about fix it. Like in this case, going by the OWASP list, um, uh, the, the modules that have significant amount of vulnerabilities in the past are uh, these modules like DCCP, SCTP, uh, so which are unwanted except for certain use cases, such as edge cases. So that has to be kept in mind and probably uh, completely disabled at, at, the, at, at the beginning itself during the, during the platform building phase. And then we have detective measures, right? So these are the uh, measures that you're going to be uh, employing to detect the undesirable events once the uh, event is ongoing or once the event is happening. 
So for this as well, right? So first thing that starts with the shift left method that Jamal talked about earlier, uh, especially it starts with the Docker file that you build. Uh, have a common abstract syntax tree parsing um, and have vulnerability and secret scanning employed on your code and the Docker file level. Uh, and lastly, for that RBAC fine tuning, while we also earlier talked about ensuring your RBAC policies are based on audit logs, audit logs does have a metadata that come with it with a couple of annotations, like a decision and a reason annotations, which would be very crucial in identifying whether uh, the right access was given to right user group or the role accordingly. So it's a constant uh, evolving aspect at that point. And as far as uh, cluster risk level is concerned as well, the amount of objects that you deployed, um, it could go, as your cluster scale, it could go out of hand as well. So you need to have certain tools, like one that comes from as Polaris, for example, that gives you a cluster risk assessment scores uh, on, on the objects that you deployed um, and, and, and how many are at risk and how many needs to be addressed. And the next one we have is uh, responsive measures. These measures are essentially, as the name suggests, it is once done, now how do I go about responding it at the end, which is the incident response part to it. Often when such things happen, you have correction of error statement that you write, uh, RCA done, you record it. Uh, now that process has to be standardized with a framework uh, to ensure that your incident response playbooks adhere to certain organizational standards for the Kubernetes clusters. And this could be uh, based on workload identifiers or service accounts or whatever uh, adjective, whatever, whatever object that you would use within the Kubernetes. Now, if we uh, want to bring it all together, uh, let me uh, take over the screen real quick. Okay, so here we have um, uh, the Threat Composer tool. So how this Threat Composer tool brings everything uh, together is something that we will see now. For example, in this tool, uh, let me zoom out a bit uh, for the people in the end. So it starts with creating a workspace. Um, let's say CN Security Con workspace. And once this workspace is created, like we were discussing earlier, this tool will help you understand, bring your application together, make the assumptions, make the application metadata, eventually create the threat control matrix that we talked about. So it starts with creating an application here, um, like you go about creating, in this case, uh, an EKS application that we saw on the screen, um, and, and define these application parameters, like this is uh, a PCI compliant workload, uh, related to certain application team, et cetera. And once you define this, it gets to a state where you upload the architecture diagram uh, for your workload uh, and, and data flows. What is the uh, data flow that we talked about in the existing EKS architecture earlier? And eventually, uh, threats, like uh, if you're gonna add a threat statement, like the server-side request forgery that we saw earlier, you go about saying an external actor that has uh, access to run kubectl port forward can um, retrieve API server metadata and which leads to um, them negatively, uh, which leads to server side request forgery and negatively impacting data confidentiality. Let's say this is the threat I created. Um, I could go about I could go about saving this to uh, the workspace, and then uh, once a mitigation for this, let's say for this the mitigation was to implement a policy management solution to block that kubectl um, port forward access in the first place. So the mitigation would then be uh, documented here on how your team can approach this. Um, 
And for this, uh, you can have a metadata of which persons, uh, like app specs me or uh, uh, adversary, are the point of contacts. And eventually, once you have this, you can generate a, a threat modeling uh, matrix like this that you can export, uh, download, print, and export to your documentation systems. For example, the one which we saw in today's chat, uh, so today's presentation, uh, was this architecture uh, with our EKS cluster that has these data access and exfiltration points. Uh, in the interest of time, I have inputted this earlier uh, today. So uh, if I have defined this application information, a data flow path uh, to a pod level like this, eventually the threat model would look something like this, wherein uh, I will have I'll have assumptions created uh, that this want to address only high vulnerabilities because it might be a lower level environment. Uh, and for this particular threat, this could be the mitigation. And across the stride framework, it maps to elevation of privilege. Uh, and uh, eventually, who are the point of contacts here? Like I have the persona side heading here or the name. It could be a personal contact there uh, for the respective teams to reach out to. Uh, and eventually, what are the impacted assets uh, that we, that they will be uh, that they need to be uh, keeping in the mind about? Like this could be an RDS database here or S3 bucket, whatever, instead of a static text. So this is how you can uh, bring together what we talked um, on. One second. Okay. You can bring together what we talked today across the uh, four question show stack framework. Um, this is uh, the QR code for you to access the tool yourself. Uh, it is an open source tool. Um, uh, you can basically test it right now, use it uh, in your organizations. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> With that, the key takeaways being uh, we have talked about need for threat modeling, some incidents, threats, attack vectors, mitigation measures, and uh, threat composer tool, and how it can help you curate that control matrix. That's pretty much what we have today. We have a couple of minutes left if you have any questions. But otherwise, thanks for being here. And uh, we are also available outside after the session if you have any questions. Um, that's pretty much what we got today. Thank you.